of the people and by the people because it's the same thing. There's a lot, a lot that goes into the phrase land grant college and almost all the time all of us completely take it for granted when in fact is a, a revolutionary concept. Revolutionary and, and it is absolutely has to do with agriculture but at a time when Americans knew agriculture was the future, not the past. That's what's, I, people think of agriculture as this quaint little thing. Fred, come on down here. Remember Mr. Blue, Mr. Green Jeans? Do you remember Mr. Yes, Green Jeans? Yes. Well, like, you know, if you were Mr. Green Jeans. You guys remember Mr. Green Jeans? Wasn't that his name? Yeah. I think it was his name. Mr. On, um, Captain Kangaroo. Right, right. Well, Americans think of farmers as what? Quaint. You know, cute little things. <laughs> right? No, don't they? Yeah, right. With a pitchfork, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but in the 19th century, that was the leading industry in all of the United States. And it was the future, it wasn't the past. Now it still is actually the future. Because we take completely for granted the fact that this is the first time in history, probably the 20th century, that most of the people, most of the time, have enough to eat. Matter of fact, you know, many of us, too much to eat. Yeah, so what? But that, but that is absolutely not Human history has been a period of, 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 of uh, regular bouts of starvation. Absolutely everywhere. Now, agriculture, 10,000 years ago, was the giant revolution that started it. But it really, it's only in modern times, of this vast uh, uh, food-producing capacity that led the way in the United States. So, but, but, but let's go back just a bit, okay? Because here's our, our land-grant college of our little spot up here. Now, I'll just give you guys know, I spent all day today putting in the fancy things on Keynote. I've never used Keynote before. This is a new program to me. Do any of you guys use Keynote? Well, do you use it? Well, I probably shouldn't have used it, bought it, because it lets you, let you do a lot of things that waste a lot of time, you know. <laughs> Which is why when I called Todd Paris today, I said, Todd, do you have a picture, a high resolution picture? <laughs> he says, oh, I'm glad you did this so far in advance, you know. Um, <laughs> but anyway, there it is. All right, that's our beginning of our little land grant college, the old main building sitting here on College Hill. And there's the, the seal, the first seal of the University of Alaska, Alaska Agricultural College and School of Mine. I love this picture for a bunch of reasons. The picture and the seal. Um, I might talk more about the seal later, but... Uh, President Bennell said of that seal, that's a picture of Mount McKinley as seen from the steps of the main building. <laughs> with, I think what he meant to add was, with the Hubble telescope. <laughs> but, now, so I have published books with the University of Alaska Press. Ross, you, you have, oh, and we have the provost. It's under the provost. So the University of Alaska Press, Susan, I'll just show you, they published this book back in the 1960s, um, Vic Fisher's book about the Constitutional Convention. I love this book. There it is right there. And what do you think is in the, on the cover? What do you think the cover is supposed to show? Denali. Denali from where, though? <laughs> this is what the, according to the University of, now, Susan, you are the provost. I think you should talk to Joan about this. This is what it says. Inside the book. <laughs> now, the thing is, that's the other thing. When you get old, you have weaker eyesight. Or else, <laughs> you know, I, I love the Mark Twain joke. You know, he said when he was young, he had a great memory. Great memory. I mean, he had the world's best memory, he said. And he could remember anything, whether it happened or not. <laughs> But now, as an old man, all he could remember was the stuff that didn't happen. So, oh, maybe this is in that fault. But anyway, so a school is about vision. Now, in this case, okay, maybe the vision was, was slightly off, but, but that, that's, that's the wonderful thing about a college. And in fact, everyone is supposed to come together. It's a community. We're supposed to be collegial and work together and think about the future and the long range and our place in the universe, and science, and research, and everything. And we'd have none of this, none of this, without this land-grant act, and Representative, and then Senator Morrell, or Morrell, however you would say his name, in 1862. Um, now I forget what I'm, oh yeah, 
Now these are a few of the buildings that are on the, on the uh, uh, these are going to be built in the university here in the near future, I think. Uh, you know, I'm sure. Oh, are we doing the <laughs> That's right, yeah. So, so, you know, okay, none of these buildings have ever been built here, and they never will be. Um, okay, now that's really sort of an important thing, because I'll get to that in a second, of what's the difference between a land-grant college and all these? Now, some, that's in England, but um, <laughs> most of the colleges in America before 1862 were private, religious colleges, and they concentrated on Latin and Greek, and the seven uh, subjects of the liberal arts, and I'll show you that in a second. But they didn't talk about anything, really, that had much practical application. Because colleges saw themselves as a world apart and, and deigned to not, to, to, to stray from the Latin and Greek curriculum. Matter of fact, it was bitterly debated in the late 19th century and early 20th, somewhat similar today, people decrying the future, because if you can't know all the Latin declinations, then in fact there's something clearly wrong with you. Um, but we don't have those buildings, but we do have the Eielson building and the plan. Now, this is my favorite headline from the farthest north collegian, President Bennell's the official publication of the University of Alaska. What do you notice is wrong with this? <laughs> the University of, uh, let's go. <laughs> well, anyway, I just thought it was so great that, that, that they make the typo in a headline that's about the future and how great it's, it's all going to be. Well, there's two buildings in particular I want you to pay attention to. Let's oh, see, I wonder if I can, I guess I can't show my, my thing. Okay, well, if I had a laser pointer, just imagine if I had one. <laughs> uh, how am I going to do this? Hmm. Well, I wonder why there's no mouse on here. Well, can you guys imagine where the Eielson building is on this? No, don't worry about it. Uh, I'll, well, let's look at a picture of it. Um, this, of course, is the dream of the Eielson building, and that's the reality. Um, <laughs> now, this is the one building that we have that was meant to emulate those other ivy-covered walls. And of course, this is the Eielson building today. Um, and w w what's that? Bill? Is that called Unit 5? Oh, no, no. I have a picture of Unit 5, though. I'll show you. Yeah, yeah. Good. You're probably the only person here who knows anything about Unit 5. That's a, so we always had great names for President Bell, some of the buildings. So Unit 5 <laughs> is the north end of what's now the Eielson building. But just to show you, um, uh, that corner, this is the southwest corner of the Austin building, still has that buttress or whatever you call it right there. And you can see it in the original uh, construction from 1936 right there. Um, now, when the Austin building was first built, as you could see, it was only one story long and it was only about 30 or 40 feet long, one story high, 30 or 40 feet long. And it was built like a typical Alaskan cabin in sections. Um, and that's why it, the, the thing about uh, 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 Unit 5 comes into play. So here's Unit 5. Um, oh, oh, wait. No, that's not Unit 5. Doggone it. I wonder if I'm showing you the wrong one. I might have skipped ahead. Well, oh, no, no, I didn't. OK, here we go. Here we go. OK. Um, well, OK, I have some goofy, just to let you know, uh, animations coming up here in a second, so don't be frightened by them. <laughs> but anyway, this is actually a picture of the university in 1938, uh, shot by Bradford Washburn. Um, and I have some other examples of it I can show you. Because this is actually, this is such a fantastic photo of the university, but the two buildings we're going to look at are um, the Eielson building and what we now call Signers Hall, or the museum. Because um, those are the closest that came to the sort of ivy-covered Wall. So let me just show you. Um, th that's actually the, an overlay, almost as near as I could get it, of today and 1938. Um, let me kill the lights away. Um, oh no, wait, these lights don't work. Um, and I made it slightly, I tried to make it um, 
uh, as transparent as I could, so to see, but, um, and, and I'll go back a second, but you'll get at the idea of, of where we're located. Um, you can see Signers Hall and Eilson there, right um, south of the Greening Building, okay? Um, uh, and you know, let me go back a second. So that's 1938, and this is more or less today. In the park, they're all in round things. They're hay, just to cut them. Oh, the hay, that's right. Yeah, this is the, uh, and, and I put that in here ori ori uh, originally when I did this, and I, I was going to put in a caption of the hay fields, but that's the hay fields right there. Um, President Bennell, among his many things, uh, he, uh, and you can see the, the, the bales right there. Well, they're not bales, they were loose hay, the bales hadn't come out yet. Oh, okay. So they were made of loose well, hay, and well, they were shaped round with the slope on top to keep the rain do, do, what do you call, what do you call that? Um, Wine. Cox the hay. Well, Cox the hay, okay. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Well, um, so among President Bennell's things, he refused, or, or he wanted to make every inch of the university pay off. So, yeah, so here's, here's the hay fields. Okay, you could see them right there. The other thing, President Bennell's rules, no trees could be planted on the campus. He allowed no trees because they were such a pain to mow around. Um, and uh, so, so when they cleared the land, that was the end of the trees. Um, this is Signers Hall, what we now call Signers Hall, and that's the Eilson building right there. Um, okay, and just to show you, this was in the University of Alaska of the future, that's the Eilson building, and that's Signers Hall right there. Originally, the Eilson building was intended to be one of seven buildings, they were all supposed to be identical. Um, and that's why it only has that funny thing here on the, on the this, um, okay, no, back here. Oops, I went too far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, hold on. These are the other buildings, remember, that didn't get built quite yet. Well, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe President Gamble has this in his plan. I don't think so. Anyway, um, right there is, oh, I see. I went the wrong way. Is that thing, right? And that thing is that thing. And that thing is that thing. Um, so it only appears on the southwest corner of the building. The reason there isn't one on the other side is because we're supposed to have all these buildings matching, right? Um, and uh, so, now, let me see here. Um, that's the, what it looks like now. Um, okay, now these are my fancy graphics, I think, coming up. It took me about three hours to do this, so, so I want you to enjoy this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, here we go. So I made this small. Now, <laughs> now, of course, that was always the problem, the fear that the building was going to burn down. Um, <laughs> that's modern times, uh, crashing in. Now here's, remember that's the other, uh, oh wait, maybe we have another special effect. <laughs> See, that's the Isles, Ciders Hall. <laughs> well, anyway, okay. <laughs> okay, so that's it, but anyway, th there they are there, okay? Um, but there generally was a fear that uh, the whole, everything is going to burn down because Signers Hall, what we now call Signers Hall, which used to be the museum and before that was the gym and the library and a whole bunch of other stuff, they were the only concrete buildings. Um, in this picture, everything else is wood, everything. Now, this remained the problem until the 1950s. Um, and let me just show you, uh, let's see, document camera just for a second. This is a, a, a uh, um, pamphlet that President Patty and Dr. Wood, I think it was Patty, I don't think it was Wood, came out in the 1950s trying to get um, money for the university. So let me just show you, this is what I love about this. So this is your university, and it says, what's the future of Alaska's higher education? Is it this, 
or that, right? People going to um, state side universities, <laughs> which we can't have that. Um, so, so here is the university has grown. Um, and what we need is less of this. of the um, one of the dorms, club dorm, and then more of this. Uh, is that Nerland Hall? I guess so, yeah. don't you think? So anyway, they've got a lot of great things in here, including our Arctic research component. Oops, don't get nauseous if you. Uh, but this is what I love about the picture of the, of the old Maine. Here it is. Uh, let's see here. Here's the caption. Uh, no, but it was torn down, but it, it should have burned, I guess. Um, so what it says is, this is the main building. Uh, the center was built in 1918, a wing added in 23, and then the new wing, the final wing in 25. Um, uh, great service to the territory. <laughs> Fires have started in the building several times, but since the building is closely guarded, the fires were quickly extinguished. The structure has had a charmed life. Um, a major, wood, major fire would destroy much valuable equipment and likely spread to other buildings. The building is so old and out of date, it's expensive to heat and maintain. We do not want to erect new buildings near it. It now houses the departments of liberal arts, biology, BA, chemistry, ed, and numerous faculty offices. Our proposed construction plan preparing us to tear down this building. And it was, um, we sure need Reagan. You know, it could have been, Dr. Patty, tear down this building. But anyway, it did get torn down. It's right in front of, the, uh, well, the Bennell building where it sits it is just like 10 or 15 feet south of where this thing sat. Um, but so going back to the fire, to, the, to, to this, um, well, I'm not going to repeat the, the, <laughs> but I want to talk about this. This is why the need for the land grant college evolved. Because education was Greek and Latin till at least the middle of the 19th century in the United States. Despite the fact that there were a number of what they were so called polytechnic institutes and things that developed like MIT, technological colleges. Um, the overwhelming idea of higher education was studying Latin and Greek. Period. And the idea was, if you, if, you, if you mastered Latin and Greek and literature, um, the, and, and largely its memorization um, and recitation, um, that gives you the basic skills or discipline. Because the word discipline comes from the Latin word, which means to learn. So the whole idea is, in fact, that that's the edu educational training, the boot camp that people actually need. Now, um, so the problem is, you have this rapidly growing country. America is exploding at the seams of the 19th century. Um, and the final burst is clearly going to come as a result of the Civil War. It's no accident at all that President Lincoln signed this bill in 1862, that creating the land-grant colleges, and that President Buchanan had vetoed it shortly before the war. The reason is the South and those who were opposed to expansion of federal power would never have allowed the land grant bill to go through. They, they, or, or they had done their best repeatedly to block it. Um, the idea of having land grant colleges or somehow indirectly funding new higher education institutes had been around for 20 or 30 years. Um, but it's, it's, the, it's the absence of the Southern senators and congressmen, really, that make it overwhelmingly popular. The same thing with the Homestead Act, and the same thing with the railroad grants. Um, because the South feared Western expansion, because they knew as America moved West, new states were added, the voting power of the South would be diminished, and slavery essentially would be doomed. Actually, it's, it's almost identical to the opposition to Alaska statehood in the 1950s, except at that time, um, the, it wasn't really about slavery, but it was about segregation laws. And, uh, and Alaska was principally blocked because Southerners did not want any new states that would vote to, um, uh, for cloture to end the Southern, um, um, what do you call it when they talk all the time? 
uh, filibusters uh, uh, on the civil rights bills. Um, and, and remember the South, as one writer said, the, the, the Senate, the U.S. Senate in the 1950s was the South's revenge for the Civil War because they controlled the Senate and they controlled all the senior committees in the House because of, long, because of their longevity in, in both bodies um, and the fact that the South was a one-party state. There were no Republicans in the South, none really until uh, Nixon in 1968. Um, so, okay, so we got the Greeks and there's the seven uh, uh, classic liberal arts. Um, from left to right, uh, the arithmetic, geometry, music, astronomy, um, logic, uh, law, rhetoric, and grammar. Um, and what I like about this is that the, the initial three here on the bottom, this is actually the seal of the, uni of the University of Pennsylvania still uh, in the, uh, it's essentially still the seal of the University of Pennsylvania based on the, on the seven liberal arts that a, that a college educated person could master, I think there's seven, right? Three, four, seven. Yeah, that's the seven liberal arts. Um, uh, what I love is that the, the first three were called the trivium, and then the next four are the quadrivium, you know, the four. The three roads are the first three, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. And then the four, math, philosophy, astronomy, and theology are the next four. Look at this heavy metal band. They call themselves the trivium. And there's four of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, and, I, and here they are. They're really proud of themselves. I mean, <laughs> but, but this is called the quad. This this little uh, this quartet isn't that great? You know. Anyway, they they are called the quad. I found this on the internet. They're the quadridium or whatever they they say. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So here we go to. Uh, Justin Morrell of uh, Vermont, and absolutely, he, his, um, uh, he, he has a really interesting background. Um, he, he, he comes from really poor circumstances. He's the child of blacksmiths and the oldest of 10 children. Um, his education ends when he's 14 years old. That's really the end. He does go to what was called in those days an academy for a couple of years, but that was to the end of it. And he never went to college, never had the opportunity. Became a very successful businessman, uh, essentially with uh, stuff working with his, uh, his family. Um, and Fred, you're absolutely correct. He spent 44 years in Congress from 1855 to 1898, um, the last 32 in the Senate. And he was known as, and I forget now why, I, you know, I, because I'm new to this keynote thing, I think I made several versions of this talk. And because I have no memory, I, I forget that I did it. But he was known as the father of the Senate um, at the time that he died because he was the longest serving congressman in American history up till 1898. Um, oh yeah, good, that I left it in there, the father of the Senate. And then today he still ranks 20th all time. Ted Stevens for comparison is 40th. Just shows you how long that he was in there. Ted is 40th, um, but they're similar in a sense that a very long tenure and a fact that he, Morell became convinced of this idea of a, of a new system of colleges. Now here's a quote I got from the North American Review. Um, I screwed it up. Well, I got the quotation in there. By the mid 19th century, clearly a need for advanced education on some other basis than the literature of Greece and Rome, oh, okay, was needed. Um, uh, that's 1867, that's, that's looking back five years afterwards and saying America has a serious problem and the only way around it is federal involvement. Um, now here's the Morrell Act, this is what it sort of involves. Um, the important thing to note is it is land grants to fund an entirely new type of college, revolutionary. They never existed anywhere on earth. This is the beginning of something completely different. Um, and that in itself is the issue. It's federal funding for higher education, which never existed before. Now, in its years, this would have a problematic up and down chart. The, I'll get closer, a, a problematic um, uh, history because the funding wasn't always as effective perhaps as it could have been or should have been. Um, but what you have to know is that the federal government had a policy of acres for education. 
See, remember, in the 19th century, we funded the federal government strictly on the tariff. There was no income tax. And um, so basically, the, the federal government was so small pre-Civil War, um, very few Americans would recognize it today. Uh, as far as it's, it's uh, so many things that we completely take for granted going back to the Civil War, like for instance, national banks, which didn't exist really until the Civil War. Well, um, so he, he proposed land or acres for education, for higher education. The federal government had always made school section grants in Western lands to support um, uh, up to 12th grade, you know, the lower educational ranks. That was very common. That was completely accepted. The, uh, the, the revolutionary part here is to say, OK, we're going to do it for higher education, which some people thought was nothing but a pure luxury. And really, the farther west you went, the more skeptical people were about higher education anyway. Um, but so he provides in this grant an entirely new system. Um, and this is the quote. It's, it's really crucial. The leading object shall be to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes. Um, he does not intend everybody going these to be farmers or even industrial workers. But his idea is that anybody should be able to study anything. Now, farming at this time, of course, is the big industry. Um, and, and certainly, he, he doesn't look down upon it. Nobody does. I mean, this is what makes it popular and successful. And heaven knew we needed research, that, or the application of research to um, agricultural techniques, because that was the backbone of the US economy still. And remember, this is before any of the transcontinental railroads are built. Um, so, and Morrill's famous line, he said, the farmers could grow two blades of grass where only one had grown before. Um, now, this is a quote from him in the 1890s, just to show you. He says, it is perhaps from Morrill. Uh, Needless to say, these colleges were not established or endowed for the sole purpose of teaching ag. Their object was to give an opportunity for those engaged in industrial pursuits to obtain some knowledge of the practical sciences related to agriculture and the mechanic arts, such as they could not then obtain at most of our institutions called classical colleges, with languages Greek and Latin, French and German, absorb perhaps two thirds of all the time of the students while in college. And then the final graph. It never was intended to force the boys of farmers going into these institutions so to study that they should all come out farmers. It was merely intended to give them an opportunity to do so and to do so with advantage if they saw fit. So, but what's incredible about this, the, the most earth shaking part is the federal investment in higher education. That's, that's what's different here. And this makes all the difference. Many of the land-grant colleges in the United States are the most prestigious research and teaching universities that have ever existed now. And initially, they were scoffed at by the classical um, colleges. Because the whole idea they thought of something that was practical was antithetical to the idea of higher education. So every time I hear, and, and that's why I think when we say that we're, remember, we're also a space and a, a, a sea and land, sea, and space grant institution. Um, to a certain extent, those modern applications, because it became a, a, a sea grant university in the 60s, I, I forget when, when the application was made, and the, the, the space was like in the 80s or 90s. Um, it, the, the part back here then is the funding mechanism. Now, the funding mechanism was kind of goofy. I initially, the, the compromise they worked out was that each state would get about 30,000 acres for each member of their congressional delegation. So a three-member delegation, two senators, and one representative would get around 90,000 acres. By 1915, when James Rickersham came up with this idea, he said Alaska should have its land-grant college, um, there, uh, Things had changed quite a bit, because 1915 is the middle of the First World War. Now the federal government is a vastly larger presence in the lives of Americans. The land-grant colleges are no longer controversial as they were initially in the 1860s. Um, clearly, agriculture is still the key thing, because we are built around the experiment station. That's why the campus is, is here, initially, because of the experimental farm. Um, now, 
the, the fact is, in Alaska, we got almost no land because, in the because none of the land in Alaska was surveyed. So, or not, I shouldn't say none, but almost none of it. Um, the estimates were, and uh, I mean, this figure sounds so ridiculous, it's hard to believe. The, the conservative estimate, well, what do you think the conservative estimate would have been how to survey all the land of Alaska in the 1940s? Anybody take a guess? What's that? Yep, that's the conservative, exactly right, Nancy, it is. That's the conservative. What's the unconservative guess? Did you hear what she said? 10,000 years. Yeah. That's before the, like I said, before the invention of writing. <laughs> I think the wheel is 10,000 <laughs> years old. Okay, the, the non-conservative guess, 40,000 years. <laughs> That's a big picture. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so basically, us as a land-grant college, right? When we were founded from the beginning, President Bennell, the whole idea was to follow in the wake of this new idea of a school where anybody could go. There was no tuition to, at the university till after the 1950s. There was no tuition. You paid room and board. Um, uh, and remember, when we first opened in 1921, um, 22, first students arrived, uh, there were six students, the very first day, six students and six faculty members. And President Bennell always said, actually Dr. Cashin, Bill Cashin, uh, who, who's a great historian of the university and math teacher here for many years, and who knew President Bennell, um, he said, you know, Bennell never liked to say this thing about the six students and six teachers, because he was a teacher, damn it. So there were seven teachers <laughs> and six students. So, and no administrators, I guess, according to President Bunnell, though he maybe was also the, he's also the janitor. Um, so what does this mean for us? It means, in fact, that we, we have this unbelievable heritage here. Um, we're so lucky that, in fact, during the most terrible time of American history, 1862, Civil War is still going terrible. It's a disaster. It's terrible. Matter of fact, the, the act, one of the great things about, is, is that the, because the Civil War distracted everybody, that's why the railroad grants, the Homestead Act, and this in part got through because there was a lot more, you know, this would have been much more revolutionary and people would know more about it if in fact if it didn't occur during the war. But you hear people say land-grant college and they have no idea what it's about. They have no idea that this was the, one of the greatest American innovations in history to, to, for a country like ours, which didn't have a strong federal presence, to figure out that acres could support education. And of course now this is the fundamental problem that we face in the future, is, is the funding mechanism. Um, so I think that's my, Last slide here, the way I did it. Yeah, okay, so um, I, I, I'd be glad to, oh, it didn't turn off, okay, well, all right. Um, now, I actually could talk about this like forever and a lot of other different things, so I, I, anybody have questions or what should I, what else should we do? Yes? Say that again, Ruth? When did home economics enter into the picture? Um, well, I remember um, Mrs. Walsh, so when I was a student at the University, Mrs. Walsh was still, what's Miss Walsh? What was? Ann Walsh. Walsh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Still taught, taught, oh, my. But tell you the truth, I don't know. Uh, well, I brought the catalog. You, oh, you're, I, I don't really know much about home economics, to tell you the truth. Um, I brought the catalog. I, I, anyway, I have the list here, in my, in my other, and I could show you about what the courses. Maybe I should show you the list of the first courses that we had. Um, uh, believe it or not, in the 1920s, um, uh, here, let me, let me show you. Now, this, is, this I have in PowerPoint. Uh, Dr. Duck, yeah, uh, there's my, uh, oh, there's my tax. I didn't do my taxes yet, though, unfortunately. <laughs> this is why. Yeah. Oh, am I supposed to stop? Or? No, no, no. Oh, yeah. We were talking about the question. And we're, oh, yeah, we're yeah, yeah. Quite sure. Yeah, we're these guys to, know. Yeah. We know that they, it probably happened before 1890, which is the fact that it happened. Oh, yeah. Uh, so sometime probably between 1870 and, what's that, 1887, yeah, 87, some of that area is when home economics became part of land 
grant institution. You know, Yeah, and see, now the idea is that what's so wonderful about home economics, the extension service, I think KUAC, uh, the Community and Technical College, these are all part of a land grant mission, see, th th in a way. I mean, even though maybe it isn't officially, that's the way I have always thought of it, because, you know, studying Latin and Greek is actually fine for people who want to do that. But, but, but the real science, matter of fact, in the 1860s, um, this one author said they shouldn't be called agricultural colleges. See, some people get the wrong idea about them and they think it was just about agriculture, but in fact it could be about anything. It's just that they were opening the window so far. Now Ruth, just to mention, this is the, the catalog from 1932. Um, and uh, so here, let's, if you can see that. Um, designed primarily for homemakers, uh, graduates can find employment in vocations running to homemaking. Demand for teachers of home ec, dietitians, nutrition, lunchroom managers, social workers, designers, etc. Salaries which compare very favorably with those of other vocations requiring special training. Um, one thing that I always liked was, you know, uh, Lola Tilly had to quit her job, you know, at the university before the war because she got married, which is it. And, you know, in those days, if you got married, you had to quit, you know. Um, but then President Bennell called her up after the war started and changed his mind about that. You know, he, he didn't, <laughs> it wasn't so much of a, of a, of a uh, you know, detriment, I guess. Um, what other questions? I'll just find the cattle here. Yeah, oh, Ron, yeah. Do all states qualify? Yeah. I wonder about some of the other places like Rhode Island. Yeah, they all qualify. Um, matter of fact, uh, in this report, some years ago I did this report with, when Brian was the vice president um, oh, okay, here is Land Grant College without the land history of the University of Alaska's federal land grant. I must admit this was a little bit of a advocacy piece uh, that we, we, did, we did. Then we went to Pres Senator Murkowski and then um, uh, a lot of the environmentalists got really mad about this because, you know, when Fr not, uh, not, not uh, Lisa, uh, Frank, you know, this was when Frank was, <laughs> <laughs> because basically it, we wanted to get more land from the feds. And the problem is, the, the, the historical problem has been that Alaska, our whole land grant system is completely different from all the other states. We got quantity grants, not in place section grants. Um, and that's why we didn't get just 100 million acres. We got 103 and whatever the various is. Some of that land in there was supposedly for higher ed. Um, now, this was not seen this way by President Wood, President Patty. It sure as heck was seen that way by Governor Egan. And, and, the, and the, the state bureaucrats, state officials, fought the university for years about getting additional land. Now, I think we did get some land, right? A couple of years ago, right? I didn't pay attention. Does anybody remember there was a whole thing in the legislature of getting more land? I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, but anyway, to, to distinguish what's important, Land for revenue is different from land on the campus site. And I must say, the year that I was asked to do this report, yeah, it was 1993, I'm down at the guy with the, this guy who works for Brian, and I look up on this wall, and think, this big map, and it says Walmart. And it was right before they announced their big plan to sell the farm down there to Walmart, which I thought was a terrible idea. And I'm thinking, oh, God, you know. So I was glad that that got shut down. I don't know if you guys remember that, but it was a big problem. So, um, um, but anyway, what am I doing here? Oh, okay. Let me. Um, the, here's the. Uh, uh, um, I, I love this picture because it shows that um, we did everything here. Um, this is a. Uh, it was a postcard that somebody had sent out back east. Um, and um, you can see what it says on there. Um, there's the gym on the third floor, calculus. This is the main building. History of Ed, 
domestics, home, I can't see science, I can't see that, president's office. Um, now what I loved about this, and I can't remember if Bill Cashin said this or not, so the gym is up here, right? And the whole thing, so whenever the gym was in session, you know, you, you couldn't really use these floors here because it was so noisy. Oh, that's right, there's another thing in here, and I guess I cut it off. There's somebody else at their office sort of down there. But um, it includes everything. Now, here's sort of the aerial history I sometimes give of the university. This is 1925, and that's the main building. Um, and this is the, as the collegian said, no, we let go of the controls at 500 feet, and while the plane shot downwards, he used both hands to snap the picture, riding the ship as a dud across <laughs> above the roof of the main building, which is like probably not a good plan. Um, but this is 29, 38, and, and then again, this is the, the, the Washburn picture. Oh yeah, good, I put this in here. Um, this is something that uh, University Relations dug out. This is the Scarlin cabin in this picture. Um, uh, because at the original is such high quality, you can actually see it. So Moore and, and Bartlett are right here, and the Scarlin cabin is uh, here, right there, and there. Um, so now the 1940s, here now, here are the two gems, uh, <laughs> the, the Austin building and uh, Sinus Hall. Actually, maybe I, I put this in here. No, I guess I didn't, doggone it. I, I didn't put Unit 5 in here after all. But let me say something about about Unit 5, yeah. um, okay, Unit 5 is that right there. Can you guys see that? I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, Unit 5 consisted of the first floor of the Eielson building, which was concrete, and the second and third stories were a wooden building stuck on top of it. Um, and it, it, it was in use for a long time, you know, gosh, till the 70s almost, Did I think. Did he live there? Didn't Vanell live there? Uh, he didn't live there, I think. You might have put more in there, I think. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm not sure. Now, Benel's house is, is sort of down over here, you know, and, and now it's the house. Um, but one thing, these buildings were never painted in those early days. And George Rogers told me when he got to the university in 1950, he came and he said, Terrence, I'm telling you, who is it? I thought I was in the gulag. <laughs> <laughs> and Benel insisted the buildings never be painted because he thought the legislature would think that was a you know, real waste of money. Um, so you see, this is not. Peter's Hall, there's a tower. On that oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that was also the start of a shaft that went down for mining, for student underground mining, and came out at the bottom of a hill near the Atkinson Power Plant. Wow, okay, yeah. Cause, and I know, um, and th they put the bells up here, right? Wasn't that it? Uh, 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 at the this is right. Um, Oh, I don't know. It's between the Greening Building. The Greening Building is now right on the other side of this. And this was torn down in the 70s, I think. OK, that's a good, glad you pointed that out. Nothing else in here ex is still standing, except for these two things. Um, let me see. Well, that's the 50s, 70s. OK, so OK, there's that. that. Let me see if I have this other one I can show you. Oh, here it is. That's Unit 5 right there. Um, so you see, this is what I think. Uh, to me, the Eielson Building is symptomatic of the land-grant history of the university. That, now you notice it's not painted, right? Beautiful concrete. Um, <laughs> and because it's built in sections, right? So that's why when you go into the Austin building, you notice that one hallway that doesn't go anywhere, it's shut off. You know, I think there's a Xerox machine or something in there now. Um, but you can see they left open these wooden pass for the, when, when the building was eventually gonna be built. See, it actually, that's the north end right here. And you see it matches the, this thing on that end, right? Yeah. So what, I don't know what you call that, but whatever it is, that's what it is. And um, so this is called Unit 5. <laughs> and it was there for over 20 years, I think. Um, I think so. I, I, I can't remember now exactly. <laughs> but then it was subsequently moved to like sort of down here, and then it was torn down, I think, uh, 60s or 70s. Um, but you'll see they were connected. The two ends of the Austin building were connected by this little passageway right there. You know, it's like a, a little tunnel. Um, so, but what's great about this is, okay, so it's like the Land Grant College. This is, you know, they're emulating other colleges back east, but this is, there's no ivy ever on these walls, and hell, there's no paint. Um, <laughs> yeah, Joy. That, that actually comes from, originally it's laid out in 1905, um, and the, 
it, that doesn't have anything directly to do with the Morrill Act because um, agricultural experiment stations were all over Alaska. We had one, there was one in Rampart, Copper Center, Sitka. There, there were seven uh, experimental stations. Uh, experiment stations started with the Hatch Act of 1890, but uh, the first uh, experiment station was in Sitka, and uh, my understanding is unique in that uh, it reported directly to the director of the experiment station at uh, USDA. It didn't, didn't have a state structure because we weren't a state at that point, and so it became uh, a lot, lot later in the, uh, in, in our history. The, the difficulty thing, the interesting thing, Joy, is that, okay, let me go to this, um, is that, uh, okay, here's a map, uh, well, let's see here, all right, here's a map of the farm uh, from 1905, is that 1905, let me zoom out so you can see the whole thing, this is from my book on the university, um, uh, is it in focus or not? Is it okay? Um, so, the, um, the 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 farm exists first, long before the university is ever thought of, and so Wickersham's only idea is that uh, this is south facing slope. It's on the railroad, the narrow gauge railroad, which is right there. That's the narrow gauge railroad right here. Um, and when the Alaska Railroad bought this old narrow gauge, that's the right of way. So that's why the railroad is right down there at the foot of the of the hill. Um, this is right where Chena Pump Road used to come out. This is right where she, you know, it runs around the, the you know, it curves around the farm that way. So the reindeer and stuff are like in here sort of right now. Um, uh, but the, the, the difficult thing is that, and here's a early picture of produce in the uh, Fairbanks. Um, the, 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 the struggle always was between the experiment station and the university, there were some real problems in the 20s and 30s, um, which is more like bureaucratic stuff. And um, so here's the farm. Uh, let's see that way. And you can see Esther Dome in the back um, um, in the barn. I'm sure some of those buildings are still sort of down there. So, so that's the core of the university in that sense is that was the experiment um, farm. But let me go back just for a second to Unit 5, um, so this is this famous picture when this guy crashed his airplane into the building trying to kill his girlfriend in the 40s uh, and he died in the plane crash. Um, but this is the, um, so, so they built that end of the building and they built, this is concrete, you can see that, right? They got this wood building sitting on top of it because pre President Bunnell never wasted anything. Every, he reused everything because, because this was, even though this was our funding source, the land, we had no land, almost no land. It was around 9,000 acres. Um, the the, the fair, fairgrounds here in Fairbanks was a, was a part of our university land that we sold this part, the, you know, section 33. That's where the fairgrounds are now. Um, okay, so what I love is this, these two things here, and I think, let's see if I have it in the next picture. Oh, good, I got left it in here. This is the Allison Building today. Uh, I want you to look at right there. Um, so the, 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 the building never was completed. And um, th th it was supposed to be connected by a building going sideways, so it's still got that wooden panels there that can be knocked out when somebody thinks that the Eielson building should be expanded. Now, in 1950, President Moore became, took over the university. He hired an architect to get rid of, you know, everything that Bunnell did, and, uh, which is why then, you know, they fired President Moore. But um, so <laughs> this never happened. And an architect said, the Eielson building here, that's the Eielson building, he said, it's an architectural monstrosity and it shouldn't be duplicated. And look, the whole thing was, they were going to duplicate it everywhere. <laughs> they were all supposed to look like that. So I guess we could say it's a good thing that, that the Eielson building stands, but that it never had progeny. Um, <laughs> except Signers Hall. <laughs> Signers Hall was part of this. It's supposed to be the administrative complex here. In they never built it, but um, but anyway, I've talked too long. I think. Does anybody else have any more questions or or? Yeah. Uh, I've got a question that in the same frame as the one we previous about the forestry experiment station. I know I've seen a sign here. Right? Oh yeah. The forestry came in in the 60s. I want to say uh, Dr. Wood brought that in there. You say that was the Forest Service. The, the, 
the, the main forestry actually came in in 1976, I believe. Was that right? Okay. Yeah. It used to be the Institute of Agricultural Sciences, but I think it was 70, no. Yeah, it was around 76 it became an agricultural forestry experiment station. But I think you're right. I think forestry became unofficially part of it in, in, the, in, in the late 60s. That's when I think Keith Van Cleve and some of those people. Yeah. Came. Well, think about this, that forestry, mining, agriculture, engineering, um, uh, nursing, home economics, um, none of these things actually would have been included in classical education because really that was for the upper class. See, that's the other part of this. This is actually what the, the, the best history of the, is called Democracy's College. This is the democratization of higher education for good and bad. Now, the bad part of it is we accept everyone and we've always accepted everyone. And a lot of people probably shouldn't be accepted. But the theory's been that if somebody is willing to work hard enough and persevere, they can have an opportunity, unlike in the European model, where the kids are shut out. Could be by the time you're 10 or 11 or 12 years old, that's the end of it. You're never going to go to college. And uh, so I, 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 you know, I'm a graduate of the university, and I, I think you know, I wish I had known more about what it meant to be a land-grant college when I was a student, because I, I didn't know. And, um, and I think we should tell everybody this. This is a radical thing, and it's in, it's in, we're so incredibly lucky that this hap actually happened to e exist. And um, in most parts of the world, they never had anything, anything like this. Yeah, Ross. Um, yeah, Terrence, because you know, land transfers and land management is like, almost always controversial, yeah. right? And I'm wondering if there was any controversy yeah. about the land grant with, oh, yeah. with respect to like private land ownership or native land. Not, not in, uh, 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 down in the States, they, I think they, they granted about 12 million acres to the support of land grant colleges, something like that, 10 or 12 million acres. That's a, s a drop in the bucket compared to what they gave to the railroads, which is around, I think, 250 million acres or something like that. It's the size of Texas. I think that's about two of that. So, the railroads got the size of Texas. Colleges got, what's 10 million acres? I don't know. One quarter of the size of Pennsylvania, probably. I don't, I don't know. Um, not that much. So, um, but, but it, and, and in Alaska, the only controversy was the land grants never materialized because of the lack of surveys. And, and so, and, but, but you know, the reality is that cash funding is a lot better than land funding. But land funding was all they could do in the 19th century. But, but all the scholars see this is the start of the, if you want to think of the start of the NSF, this is actually it's the land grant formula from the very beginning that there'll be federal money put in the game and not just from states or, or uh, uh, churches. Because that's the difference. This is now the federal government putting its oar in the water to, um, uh, uh, to help increase the, 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 the human capital of the country. Yeah, Ron. But then they transfer that responsibility to the state and they manage it? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the one thing they did in the land grant formula, they gave them the land and said, do kind of what you want with it. And they have certain rules. I know my sister-in-law, Debbie, has to do the federal report. She says that's really complicated. Like every year, we have to do this report, right? What happens if we don't do the report? We're going to find out on May 1st. OK. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I mean, we're not going to do it. <laughs> well, let me just show you. This is a memo from um, Dr. Patty to the Board of Regents, written in 1960. Uh, OK, so see, they wanted to get this land grant. They started with this million acre land grant um, uh, already in the first year of statehood, right? Let's see, this way. So, uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, is it out of focus now? Let's see, how do you focus? Uh, okay, so look at that. So, so this is Patty's telling the board regents. Governor is mad, he, he's indicated the legislature passed this bill, he would veto it. Several members were anxious and willing to put the bill, did not encourage them. Um, so, it became extremely, um, uh, has the world's gotten smaller, the land problems become more and more and more complicated. 
you know, because the world is smaller. The world's a lot smaller now because in, in the old days, you know, the world was four miles an hour. That's how big it was. You could walk, and now it's 400 miles an hour, and that means it's a lot smaller place. So, um, so actually, so I, when I did all this research on this, I was really struck by how long the university kept trying to get additional land, and um, I, I'm embarrassed now that I don't remember, but I think the legislature finally did something. See, remember the legislature proved something and Tony Knowles vetoed it, and then there was something subsequent to that, and I think maybe when, maybe when Frank was governor, I, I, I don't remember. I'm sure it wasn't when, you know, Pam was governor. Okay, so are we, we should probably be yeah. done, I guess, right? Okay, one more oh, question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, can you say exactly what the sea and space grants are, other than that we study? We don't own specific meters of vacuum right now, man. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't know if anybody, I, I know, I, I think it's our mission. Susan, do you know? Do you know? Uh, the sea grant program. And space grant is a little bit different. It, it provides educational grants. Um, it's a smaller program uh, funded by NASA to provide educational grants to uh, students and faculty and support some research, supports the CubeSat program where Shreve built satellites to launch, things like that. And Su Susan, by the way, you guys know as the provost, so she's the academic you know, in charge of, so, of us for the university. One thing I'll say is that, and that's a really good question about the difference, see, because, because the land grant wasn't just to study land, right. and, and it's actually far broader than the sea and space. That's why I'm saying it's a little bit, also because it's a century later, the world is so vastly different. Now there is federal funding, because we had the Geophysical Institute starting in 1949, um, but, the, but the, the, the land grant idea is, is far more radical. It's, it's pilled colleges all over the place. Every single state or territory is going to be able to get one. And somebody said, that, so, so the District of Columbia has one. There's several Native American land grant colleges. They, they got, in lieu of land, money. Um, um, all six uh, island territories have uh, land grant institutions. Uh, 18, 1890 colleges. 1890 black colleges. The black colleges. Historically black colleges. colleges. And now they, uh, and, th and that was in the Jim Crow era, that's partly one reason why, so the historically black colleges was partly an, an answer, because in some of these states they weren't going to let black folks in. So, um, uh, and, and remember that's after the South has been reconstructed. Equal in, in, in that yeah, period. yeah. Now, just to show you here, this is a, 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 a I love this ad, uh, just to show you. So, it's in the, tw uh, I think late 20s. Um, but just to show you, um, so Ag, Biz, Business Administration, Chemistry, Civil, Education, General Science, Home Act, Geology, Mining, Mineral, and then it says, um, uh, it's a virile young territorial college. <laughs> 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 I, I don't know, to, it's a, and it's designed for young men and women, so I guess women are virile, or is that a subject <laughs> to men? I don't know. But, but this is when, but, but look at this. I want to point this out, though, to you. Some people think, you know, we, they would just hire anybody to the faculty here. <laughs> some, people have, some people have accused that to me, but look at that. Carefully selected. <laughs> and the thing is, I saw, er, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, the thing is, Ernest Greening, I found a note that he wrote to Bob Bartlett in a letter one time. And, you know, of course, Bunnell was president of the university for 28 years, and they had to kick him out, scheming, you know, and, he, and when they fired him, um, they said, you know, he refused to move out of his office in the Eielson building. That actually might have been in Unit 5. Maybe that was in the bottom. <laughs> um, he refused to move out of his house, so he lived in his house until he died. Uh, and President Moore had to live in the faculty housing, and you know, it was really a bad thing. Um, but so Greening said, you know, Bunnell, the only thing that lasted at the university was Bunnell, because he always said the faculty come and go, but he's there, because basically everybody served at his, his wish. I mean, if he wanted you gone, you know, 
you were gone. That's like, part of the carefully selected part. <laughs> That's right. They had to get along with him. So, but anyway, well, thank you guys all very much, and uh, uh, you're sure. Yeah.